Thank you, Chris. Welcome to this solitary boat. Makes me wonder about that word solitary. Just as um, has been said a number of times um, by Chris and Jan, both thanking us for making the temple by coming. I thank you for making this solitary boat by coming. Um, since listening uh, to John speak uh, yesterday about the way um, he had that conversation with someone, a stranger on a street corner, that led to his. Um, entering the way, meeting uh, those Tibetans. I've been uh, noticing the ways I have felt carried by um, something larger in my life. Um, that part of this uh, koan where it says, when I turn my head. Sometimes it feels like, more like when my head gets turned, a little of both. My head got turned uh, yesterday when John mentioned that, that story about meeting those Tibetans. As I remember that those were the same Tibetans that I met many years ago also. And that feeling of, um, there's a feeling of you know, timelessness, eternity. Um, that carried me to um, being here, carried me to being in a community with someone else, John, who started his practice with the same two Tibetans I started my practice with. And that doesn't feel like a coincidence. It feels like part of whatever it is that I feel carried by and held by. Mm. Um, as I recall, John said he knew he was looking for something um, at that time. And um, I can't say I was looking for anything other than having a good time, really. But then it doesn't matter, you know, what we're looking for when we're being carried that way. You don't have to know where we're going. We're being carried like that uh, solitary boat being carried. It has no oars. It doesn't need oars. I don't need, I didn't need to do anything. Just trusting that current that's carrying me, trusting the stream that's supporting me and holding me. feeling uh, inexplicably confirmed about that when my head gets turned or I turn my head and I see the motionless weeds on the riverbank. Someone once used that image of a boat going down a river and the riverbank to talk about um, uh, meditation, saying that if you're 
going down a river in a boat and you're looking at the riverbank, it looks like the riverbank is moving and you are still. But if you look more closely towards the boat, you'll notice that, in fact, the boat is moving. Something there about paying attention to what's close, right here, not over there. But that I can be carried down this river and the riverbank is motionless. Well, that's, that speaks to something for me that um, a timeless, spaceless place where there is no motion. Impossible, um, impossible coincidences. It wasn't a stranger on a street corner who told me about the Tibetans. It was um, somebody I was working in a bar with in Germany. It seems almost as improbable as a stranger on a street corner that somebody in a bar in Germany would tell me about Tibetans and their meditation course, he said. He spoke often and highly about a meditation course he had attended in Nepal with a couple of Tibetans. So when I found myself in Nepal and I'm on uh, a trek and I keep bumping into people who keep saying something about this meditation course they're going to, right? My head got turned. I could feel something calling to me. This was not a coincidence that I'm bumping into people who are going to this meditation course. And um, so I thought, well, why not? You know, I I was in the midst of taking uh, a year off from school between uh, before going into a graduate program. And, you know, I had that, I, I like courses. I thought, yeah, meditation course. So I'm going to go and hear people talk about meditation, maybe scientific studies or something. I don't know that it was happening in a Tibetan monastery and Tibetans were leading it, didn't seem to make a dent in my ideas about what a course was. And that's kind of interesting, you know. That's how it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I think. The universe is carrying me, no matter, regardless of what I think it's, I'm doing or why I'm doing it. And I suppose it was a similar kind of head turning, turning my head that kept me there when I realized that I had fallen in with, well, at first I thought maybe a cult, people doing full length prostrations. I was comforted when I was told I didn't, didn't have to do them. There was no need to do them. I wasn't required to do them, but I was invited to notice what I noticed as I didn't do them. And I did. And somehow felt again that way that um, I was being carried and held. Nothing, and I didn't have to really do anything. I didn't need oars. I didn't, I just, you know, paying attention. Just notice. So I did notice. And I noticed, um, you know, after being, you know, I noticed it so much that I stayed there for three months in a three month meditation, quote unquote, course. 
feeling that sense of being carried by something um, and feeling how it connected to something um, in me that was older than me. So why am I not practicing Tibetan practice now? Why am I here in a Zen practice? <laughs> and in a way, it's because, uh, <laughs> again, it was I've been carried by this stream. And um, my head got turned. My head got turned by going to Bhut Gaya for the Tibetan New Year. Um, to what I was told was special teachings by the Dalai Lama. I thought, wow, that's got to be good teachings from the Dalai Lama. So I went to Budgaya and discovered that um, it felt to me more like a county fair than it felt like special teachings, as there were Tibetans from the entire Indian subcontinent gathered there at this once a year opportunity to hear the special teachings of the Dalai Lama and uh, swap stories with each other and sell things to each other. And you know, it was a lively time. And after um, four months of being in, um, three months of meditation in Nepal, a one month individual silent retreat in India, prior to that, it was a bit overwhelming. And um, Yeah, I felt carried away from it against my better judgment that I should be there. It's this is a special event. It's the Dalai Lama, and I'm I'm going to get as far away from it as I can because I can't tolerate the the stimulation really. And the place that was the farthest away from the Tibetan temple in Budgaya at the time was the Japanese temple. And I went and uh, went into the Japanese temple. And that happened. After four months of psychedelic Tibetan tankas and thigh bone trumpets and cymbals and drums and deep melodious chanting. <laughs> It was just quiet. White walls, plain wood, space. And an English speaking abbot who loved to meditate and loved to invite people to join him to meditate. That was his teaching. He meditated and invited people to join him morning and night. And it felt great. And also troubled me because I could see how I could become a kind of dibbler and dabbler and a little Tibetan and a little Zen. Maybe I'll check out the Theravadins or something, you know. And um, I did something that was very uncharacteristic of me. I am. Um, uh, Lama Yeshe, my teacher, was in Budgaya, and I went to him to talk to him about my question about dibbling and dabbling and enjoying Zen practice. And um, as I say, that was against my character. I, I'm fiercely independent, counter-exampling person who doesn't, you know, hasn't met a rule. He hasn't tried to figure a way around and, um, you know, dibbling and dabbling would be just the right kind of thing for me. And yet, I, here I found myself carried, I would say, carried, held and carried to Lama Yeshe and explaining to him what was going on. <laughs> and he says, oh, Tibetan practice, that's just like 
I mean, <laughs> oh, Zen practice. That's just like Tibetan Mahamudra practice. Go, go ahead. Go to the Tibetan, go to the Japanese temple. Could have knocked me over with a feather. And so I kind of blended my Tibetan practice with Zazen because that's what I was learning, just Zazen, just sitting in silence. No mantras, no visualizations, no anything. Just sitting. Okay. So I did that for a couple of years. Stayed in India and Nepal, bounced back and forth between Lama Yeshe and Shibuya San and Budgaya. And um, then I ran, I was running out of money, so I needed to leave. And uh, the place to go, I had been told by, <laughs> again, the way that I'm held and the way that I, the universe takes care of me um, leaves me in awe and feeling a little bit unworthy, really. Um, just prior to leaving uh, Nepal, which is where I ran out of money, um, just enough to buy a ticket to take me to Bangkok and enough left over to buy another ticket to get me home. I bumped into some people, bumped into, right? Walking down the street in Kathmandu, I think it was uh, Chicken Street. And um, maybe Chicken Street was in Kabul. Anyways, um, this, this couple who I had taught English together with in Tehran um, almost three years prior and completely lost track of no internet. This is 1977. And um, I told them what my plans were and they said, oh, you're gonna go teach English and make some money. I said, yeah. And they said, well, you know, this is the best kind of ticket to get in Bangkok. And they gave me the name of a travel agency that would sell me a ticket that would be good for a year. And that would take me to Seoul, Tokyo, Honolulu, LA, and San Francisco. And I could use any part of it I wanted and then use the rest of it so long as I completed the ticket within a year. And it was renewable for a year after that even. Sounded pretty good. And they advised me not to go to Japan. because they had, um, they had been in Japan teaching English since I had seen them last. And they knew that I had been in Asia knocking around since I had seen them last. And they said, going to Japan would be too much of a culture shock for me. I'd been in Asia too long. I should go to Korea and teach English there because it's kind of funky still, and still Asia. So I thought, hmm, okay, right? Coincidence just ran into them. So I did, and I, you know, went to Bangkok, bought my ticket, went to Seoul. Got to Seoul, I had $50 left. And the ticket taking me back home, but you know, that's how much cash I had. And um, I don't know, I can't say really how much of that uh, was due to my trusting because of my meditation practice getting me in touch with this greater something or that's something I would have done even before meditating because yeah I, I actually hitchhiked through Italy with only $50 in my pocket trying to get back to Germany where I had a job waiting for me so I'd done that before but I don't think I'd done it with the um, same sense of being carried the sense of being carried that led me to walking out of the um, airport in Seoul, looking for the bus stand that would take me to the place that I had been told I could crash and meet other English teachers who would help me find a job. I didn't get that far. Someone ran up to me and said, you're American. I said, yeah. He says, you're here to teach English. I said, yeah. I have a job for you. I said, okay, I have a place for you to live. Hmm. Come with me. 
I did. It was kind of a crazy place. It was him and his brother who had an apartment with like two bedrooms and, you know, they slept in one bedroom. I slept in the other bedroom. And then when I woke up, I turned my bedroom into an English teaching classroom and they had people come and they were my shills and I taught English and they paid me. And, you know, it was kind of interesting. I never did spend that $50. And ended up uh, actually with a better job teaching at Yonsei University at their foreign language school. Um, and studying Korean at their foreign language school for free because I was a faculty member. And, you know, things were going great. I had my meditation practice. I was living in a little room, like a meditation cell. I meditated a lot and taught English and studied Korean. And every once in a while, I went down to uh, a temple where there were a lot, a lot of foreigners and I could uh, meditate. That's where I met uh, Kusan, who was my first instruction in koan meditation practice. Make your mind a question mark, he told me. Just carried to him. So then uh, it was getting to be about a year that I'd been in Korea, and I'm thinking, this is great. I've got a great job. I'm learning the language. I had two girlfriends who knew about each other and they didn't care. I mean, so I went down to Korean Airlines to extend my ticket another year. I figured, yeah, I could do another year of this. Easy. And the clerk at the counter looked at my ticket and said, yes, no problem. I'll be right back. And he came back in a few minutes and he says, there's a problem. And I said, mm. he says, the travel agency you bought your ticket from in Bangkok went bankrupt and never paid Korean Airlines for your ticket. We will honor your ticket, but we will not extend it. It expired in one week. So here I am, faculty member of Yonsei University, learning the language, getting to really feel great about what's going on. And my head got turned. Or maybe I turned my head. It was a sort of 50 50 thing. Turning my head to that eternal bank of water weeds that was out there and in here at the same time. And I could feel that this was too weird for me to ignore. And as nonsensical as it seemed in a way, to quit my job, say goodbye to my girlfriends, and, and leave, not knowing what I was going to do, that's what I did. Well, I kind of did know what I was going to do. I knew that I was not going back to mainland America, which I had been away from for a long time. I wasn't ready for that. But I did also uh, knew that I had a friend who I had left the States with many years prior to that, who was living in Honolulu. So I thought, I'll go to Honolulu, let my ticket expire there, and then I'll figure it out. I had money in my pocket from teaching English. So I got to Honolulu and looked up my friend Brian, and he didn't live there anymore. So I'm in Honolulu looking for a friend who doesn't live there anymore. And it doesn't matter. It didn't matter that... That's what I, and I thought, you know, I thought what I thought. You can imagine what I thought. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. And also there was just, again, that kind of head turning to something and feeling underneath me, almost viscerally uh, support that was somehow carrying. This was too weird also. It was like Korean Airlines again, or still. So rather than just jumping on a plane and going back to, you know, see my family, which I hadn't seen for a long time, um, uh, I didn't, I, I hung out for a bit in Honolulu. I was staying somewhere, YMCA or something. And I thought, I'll go up to the university.
also, I thought I'd go up to the university because way back when, when I did that meditation course for a month that turned into three, when it was over, one of the people I met there um, gave me a piece of paper with uh, some names and addresses on it of places that he had been, uh, various places in the world where he said, you know, you might want to check these places out if you're ever there. And one of them was in Honolulu. It was called the uh, Kokoan Zendo. And it was up by the university I found on a map. I thought, well, you know, it's up by the university. I'll go check out the university and maybe I'll check out the Zendo. We'll see. I've been practicing alone in Korea pretty much for a year and I was missing community, really. So I went up to the university and went to the student union and got a cup of coffee and I was sitting there drinking a cup of coffee. And I mean, University of Hawaii, I know is a pretty beautiful place, you know. Um, you could sustain yourself on the fruit trees that were on the campus if you were lucky and quick. So that wasn't difficult to do, hanging out there. And then, you know, there's the bulletin board plastered with uh, three by five cards. It was June, so school was out, but the cards were still up and, and flyers, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper was announcements about various programs and such. And I saw a flyer for the Asian no, it was for the religion department, which didn't interest me, but it was for uh, something about Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Chan. I thought, wow, religion departments that study Buddhism? I didn't know that happened. So I got my curiosity. And again, why did I go to that bulletin board? Why did I see that piece of paper? Why didn't I just say, hmm, that's interesting, and then leave? I was carried and held to the religion department on the third floor of Sakamaki Hall at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, where there's another bulletin board with just stuff about the religion department's programs. And they had all, they had Taoist stuff and Christian stuff and Islamic stuff. It was, wow, that was interesting. And as I was standing there, um, Someone came up behind me and said, can I help you? And I turned around and it was um, uh, someone named David Chappell, who's a professor at, in that department. And um, I told him that, you know, how blown away I was by all of this. And he said, oh, and he asked me a couple of questions. And I told him that I just gotten back from Asia where I've been doing this and that. And he said, oh, would you like a cup of tea? I said, sure, we had a cup of tea. Again, I think um, if I'd had two cups of coffee, I wouldn't have met him, right? Coincidence, that doesn't feel that way. Feels like that solitary boat being carried in the moonlight. You all might feel that way about being here. So we were drinking our tea and talking, and he says, well, you're just the kind of person we're looking for for to be in our graduate program. Would you be interested? <laughs> I could offer you a teaching uh, uh, assistant position. You wouldn't have to pay tuition, and you'd get paid to go to school. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hmm. It was kind of, you know, let me think about that, I said. And I left. Actually, before I left, though, something happened that was also, it, it feels like that being carried and held feeling I got. And what happened was someone sneezed. But it was the granddaddy of all. I had never heard somebody sneeze like that before. And it came from down the hall and I don't know where it came. It came from the depths of the earth. 
anyways. And that got my attention. I was, I thought, who sneezes like that? I actually found out his name was Mitsuo Aoki. He was a professor in the department and I became his teaching assistant for two years. <laughs> and he's a pretty interesting guy. So I left and I went back down to student union and got that second cup of coffee. And I'm looking at that bulletin board again. And I notice, huh, there's advertisements for places for rent because, well, you know, the school year is over. Students have left and now people are renting their empty places. And I thought, huh. And I see this one that's something, 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 University Avenue. I'm going, University Avenue? Well, that's just over there. Let me go check that out. And I was a little surprised to see that it was a dentist's office. It was like a ranch, you know, one floor kind of ranch style home that had been turned into a dental office. But the garage had been turned into a studio apartment. And that's what they were renting for <laughs> ridiculously cheap. And I talked to them. I said, okay, let me think about it. And then about it five minute walk from that place, going away from the university, away from uni University Avenue, 211, what was the address? Whatever it was, Koloa Way, was the um, uh, Kokoan Zendo that I had been told about. And uh, So I went and I found it and it was, you know, it would, didn't look like a Zendo. It looked like a kind of nice house, two-story house, sort of sit down below the street grade. And I thought, oh, okay, well, let me check it out. This is kind of interesting. I'd been coming from a kind of monastic tradition and sitting in temples and monogompas and whatever. And the idea of uh, a, a Zen community and a normal house was kind of intriguing. And I thought, well, it's a it's a temple, right? So you just walk in. I don't know, ringing the doorbell at a temple somehow didn't seem right. So I walked up to the front door and opened the front door. And um, just as I opened the front door, there was a very loud voice coming from what looked like a very large beard right about up here. And it was John Tarrant telling me that we don't come in that way. We come in through the kitchen. <laughs> oh. Um, I couldn't say it was an auspicious first meeting. I, you know, <laughs> getting yelled at, but um, the beard was impressive. So again, um, I'm being carried. I've got a job. I've got a place to live. I've got a place to practice. And I haven't done anything. I don't have any oars. And after uh, uh, almost three years there, I was sitting in my office at Sakamaki Hall when my professor, David Chapel walked in and said, how'd you like to go to Japan? I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I was experiencing enough culture shock even in Hawaii to want to get out and going to Japan sounded just fine. And he says, well, write up a research project and we'll see if we can get you on this uh, program that we have with Komazawa University. Um, and again, I, you know, you, I could say, well, I had to write up a research project, but, you know, I had just found a book about, by a guy named David Reynolds about Morita psychotherapy, and I was kind of interested in it because I had an undergraduate degree in psychotherapy and was convinced I was going to eventually do that kind of work, but um, and this Morita psychotherapy was related to Zen. That's interesting. So <laughs> I basically copied the review of the book and turned it in as my research project. And I was um, uh, accepted to go to Japan. And um, I still haven't done anything. And now I have a 
fellowship to go to Japan is going to pay me to go to Japan and pay me while I'm in Japan. And uh, again, not um, how to say, I was not having a great time with uh, myself at the Zen, at Kokoan Zendo. I wasn't connecting with um, the teacher and um, was kind of uh, at a loss as what to do about that, other than keep sitting in a way. Didn't like koans, didn't, they disturbed me. And I was, that was not what meditation was about. I was convinced. So um, I wasn't thinking about finding uh, some other teacher when I went to Japan, when I accepted that offer of a fellowship. And um, I was being mostly courteous, I thought, when uh, the teacher in Japan offered to write me a letter of introduction to his teacher in Kamakura, Yamada. And when Aiken Roshi uh, offered to do that, I really wasn't interested in his teacher. I thought, well, if I don't connect with him, how am I going to connect with his teacher, who I'd met and kind of liked, but still. So I had this letter of introduction. I had this fellowship. I'm going to Japan. Um, first day in Japan, right? I arrive in Narita, make my way down to Kamakura uh, because I've come early and my room in the dormitory at Komazawa University isn't ready yet, but I have a room in Omachi, which is the name of a section of Kamakura, in a home that was 100 years old, classic Japanese home in a huge garden that you couldn't even see the street from when you're in the house. And I have a room in that house because by chance, I was in the kitchen at Koko Zendo when Paul Shepard came in. Paul Shepard was living in Kamakura at the time and was a student in the Koko Zendo at a time, currently a student at um, in Kamakura who said, oh, you're going to Japan. Let me get you a room at Omachi so you can stay there when you practice at the Zendo. And I kind of thought I was being polite by accepting his offer, but when I saw the room <laughs> and the place, the surroundings, 10 minutes from the, the uh, train station, but surrounded by forest. Ah, and then I was said, here's your room and here's your bicycle to use while you're here. Great. I jumped on my bicycle, went back down to the train station to, you know, I just got to Japan. This is wow. And um, part of my exploring the wow was going into a department store that was there by the train station that had a supermarket as part of it. To just check it out, you know, what's life like in Japan. And I was standing at the fish counter where, where all the fish was, just in awe of how expensive it was. When I heard a voice behind me say, you must be the new guy in town. And I turned around and it was John Joseph. You may know him, right? He's here somewhere. Um, and that sense of being carried is, I, I don't know, it's getting, I, am, I making, am I making it up? Am I suffering from some kind of delusions? I don't think so. So everything is feeling really great, but I'm faced with like, the prospect of actually meeting Yamada Roshi with my letter of introduction that I'm wondering what's in there because Aiken Roshi and I didn't really part on the greatest of terms. You know, I told him that he couldn't hear me and he told me he couldn't help me. So, I mean, I wonder what's in the letter. <laughs> I also told him that I didn't like koans and wasn't going to sit with them. So what's in the letter? As I am um, about to give this letter to the preeminent koan master of the world, in my estimation at the time. But then... Um, I had to do that. 
and um, there's something about yeah, something about the boat again. I want to get back to um, this boat. This is the boat that came in in this envelope, which you may recognize. Thank you, Christina. And um, with, uh, where's my hand? That snowflake stuck on my altar. And that little square rec or rectangular uh, is Corey's collage painting. A little small, but I know what it is. Now you do too. But this boat is great. And what's particularly great about this boat for me is, and I'm not sure you're going to see this. You saw that stuff fall out? It's not empty. Um, and how that's important to me that it's not empty. Because what that says to me is, I don't have to be empty. I don't have to get rid of anything. I can be full of me, just me, the way I am. I think that's part of what was going on back in Bud Gaya when I went to talk to uh, Lama Yeshe. It was like, well, he's my teacher. I've got to be able to tell him what's the truth. And the truth is, I don't want to be here with all this noise. And I want to go over there. I'm worried he might kick me out or something, but I've got to tell him because I've, it's got to be about all of me, not just part of me. That was the same kind of feeling I had with Aiken Roshi when I, during one of our uh, conversations, right? Those conversations are called dokusan, right, in Japanese. Uh, going alone would be one translation. Um, I found it to be, you know, uh, somewhat like this, the um, solid alone in that boat. I'm so not alone. And in that so not aloneness with everything really, there is nobody else. There's not even me, or there's only me, or what, you know. So anyways, thank you for that stuff in the boat, Christina. Because I think uh, what I cherish about Zen practice as opposed to some other um, ways of practicing is we don't try to get rid of anything. It's about being all of who we are, embracing it all and finding support in that, holding ourselves in the way that I have felt held by the universe, even. So telling Aiken Roshi in that conversation of Doksan, you know, Roshi, when you and I talk, this is what it feels like. <laughs> and he leaned forward and goes, that's you, not me. Which was so great because it confirmed exactly what I was saying. <laughs> And I actually left it kind of encouraged. I thought, great, I'm not wrong. He does not hear me. We don't connect. And um, there was no fault to that. It was just a fact that was interesting. But I had to tell him that somehow. I had to be able to have, you know, that piece of me in the boat. So I had to tell you, Mada. <laughs> when he asked me, uh, what is your practice? And the, the standard answer would have been, my practice is Mu. Because everybody's practice was Mu, unless you had passed Mu. And, um, and instead of saying, my practice is Mu, I said, Shikantaza, just sitting, just sitting. And my heart was racing. And I was prepared to sort of be yelled at so loud that I would be blown out of the room backwards or something. Um, <laughs> but that's not what happened. 
He said, Shikantaza. That sucking air sound means difficult in Japanese. So he sucked air for a while and he goes, oh, Shikantaza, very difficult practice. Not many people come to realization with Shikantaza. Maybe last person who came to realization with Shikantaza, Dogen, talking 12th century, 15th century. But I want you to come to realization with Shikantaza, please practice diligently. Could have knocked me over with a feather again. Um, of course, yeah, and I, that sense of being seen, held, carried, all of me, the, even the parts of me that I have questions about, fears, doubts, whatever, all of it, and feeling it all held. I think that's what the practice offers us for ourselves to be able to do that for ourselves too. Not only to be able to feel it coming from out there, but to feel it coming from in here. Of course, um, I'm sorry, something just popped up on my screen. I don't know what it is. Um, now I can't see you. Ah, there you are. Um, the whole purpose of your life contains the current matter. Mm. As something pops up on my screen, obscuring you. Obscuring what I was going to say next. Of course, what Yamada did after telling me and supporting me and encouraging me to practice with Shikantaza was ask me a question. He says, I want to ask you a question. And um, I said, okay. And he says, I don't want you to think about it. I might ask you about it sometime later on or not. And I'm, I'm still so blown away by having been supported in what I said that I'm just, okay, okay. I think I was kind of just, okay. Didn't seem suspicious to me. It didn't seem weird to me. It was just like, okay. And he said, stop the sound of the distant temple bell. I said, okay. <laughs> didn't seem like a weird question. I just, okay. And um, another way that I feel incredibly supported by whatever, and carried by whatever, the Tao, is that I met, that I had a Tibetan practice. I had a foundation in Tibetan practice. And that foundation told me not to talk about my practice with others because of getting possibly confused, which I don't agree with at this moment but at that time that's what my was it was in me don't talk about your practice with others so i didn't i never said that to anybody in the sangha there in kamakura i didn't say you know the roshi asked me this weird question didn't do that i just i didn't even think about the weird question really it was like i didn't think about it much until he started asking me about it every once in a while and i go oh yeah that one because if I had said anything to anybody who had been there for a while, who had been uh, gotten their toes wet in koan practice, I'm pretty sure they would have told me, oh, that's a koan. That's one of the miscellaneous koans or whatever. And it would have, I don't know, it would have been really interesting. I don't know how that would have unfolded, but I'm very grateful that I don't have to know because it didn't. Um,
couple more instances of being held and I'm going to stop. Um, so after my uh, fellowship ended, uh, I stayed in Japan to continue practicing with Yamada and um, got a job teaching English again because that was my trade, really. And um, when a retreat came around in Kamakura, which happens six times a year, one week retreat, six times a year, um, uh, it was possible to get permission to leave the retreat to go do your work if you needed to go do your work to make money. And I appreciated that. It was kind of a way that the practice was integrated there. Um, people understood that you you have a life and how to how do you integrate these things, uh, an intensive retreat and having a job needing to work. So I had permission to go teach one evening and I uh, left the Zendo uh, prior to the evening meal semi-intentionally. I could have probably made my class if I would have waited around and had the meal at the Zendo, but I was kind of yearning for something other than Zendo food. I was kind of yearning for a chicken fillet sandwich at Kentucky Fried Chicken near the train station at the town I was going to where I was going to teach English. Tell the truth. I've got to include all of me, right? Okay, another part of me. And um, so I did. Uh, Jumped on the train in Kamakura and wrote 15 minutes to a town called Totsuka, where I was teaching at a Hitachi uh, research and development laboratory. And prior to that class, I went to the Kentucky Fried Chicken near the train station. Got my chicken fillet sandwich and fries and a Coke, probably. And the, the eating area was upstairs because, you know, Japan is kind of a tight place there's not a lot of space so they stack things up so you order your food downstairs and go up a spiral staircase to the eating area upstairs on top and as i was coming around the spiral staircase and my head's coming up above the floor the only thing i can see is a woman sitting by herself in the corner and um it was like doksan it was like i saw her and i thought I'm going to talk to her. And I did. And um, and it turned out that um, we actually both lived in Kamakura, which is strange, interesting. Turned out that we actually both went to the same wine bar a lot, but somehow I'd never met. Well, that's interesting. And um, I explained that I was in the middle of a meditation retreat, but let's get together when it's over. And we did um, on the night that the retreat ended. And um, we've been living together since that night. And I feel very much carried about that. I'm very grateful to my practice about that. And I did express that gratitude to Yamada Roshi when we got married too, uh, because, you know, I didn't do anything. No oars were involved, just the boat being carried in the moonlight. And I think the last way that I um, feel carried, have been carried, was um, um, well, I got married to that woman from Kentucky Fried Chicken, Sarasa. And after we were together for a few years, I was feeling like I was tired of being an English teacher and wanted to pursue the um, what I felt carried to do, which was to work uh, doing the kind of psychotherapy work that I'm doing, but I needed to get trained. And um, it was great because at the time, all of the multinational companies in the world were sending people to Tokyo, uprooting families and causing great disturbances and lots of work for family therapists in Tokyo. 
English speaking family therapist. And I thought I, I could see my whole life laid out in front of me. I'm going to go back to the States real quick, get a degree, get a license, and come back to Japan and continue practicing with Yamada and being a psychotherapist in Tokyo and be, live happily ever after. And um, it was just about that time that I can't remember exactly how, but I heard that uh, John Tarrant was moving from Hawaii to Sonoma County. And the difficult choice that I was trying to make between Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado and the uh, CIIS in San Francisco became much less difficult because it was like, well, there was no, there was no decision to be made. I'm coming here to be with John, who's a teacher, an old friend. Um, and that was a while ago. And I'm still grateful for that one. So um, um, I'm also grateful for the, the way that we've been so quiet so far as we've been launching this boat into the stream. And, um, you know, there was no big hoopla last night. We didn't all put our voices in the room. We did a lot of meditation and that was so great. In the morning, it's so quiet. And I don't want to make it any noisier by opening things up to questions and stuff. What I'd like to do would be, if you have questions and you have comments, bring them to your conversation this afternoon with whoever you're going to talk with. And, you know, uh, I'd like to just spend a moment with that silence before I end. Thank you. Thank you.